Pentagon. The day before 9-1-1, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld declared war. Not on foreign terrorists. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. $2.3 trillion, with a T. That's $8,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheSeedsOfLiberty.com and TheConsciousResistance.com. So today I have Jason Bassler coming in from California. He's the co-founder of the Free Thought Project, V is for Voluntary, and the founder of Police the Police on Facebook. And you can also find Free Thought Project on Instagram and YouTube, and also their website is Free Thought Project. Com. So today we're going to discuss uh, a little bit about his path to volunteerism and any uh, books, personalities, or authors that have uh, influenced. And, uh, you know, how did uh, the Free Thought Project start? I think uh, most people want to know about a 1.3 million like page. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and also maybe his thoughts on, uh, on the state of law enforcement today. So, Jason, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, sir. Appreciate the opportunity. No problem. I uh, I saw you on uh, on Anarchast was a couple months ago, and uh, Jeff Borick he plucked you out of the crowd, <laughs> and you looked like you were unwilling. You're like, no, 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 I don't want to be in front of the camera. <laughs> He's like, it no, unex- it was a little unexpected. Yeah, <laughs> no, you're going in front of the camera right now, <laughs> and uh, and so it was a good conversation. I didn't expect to see you there, but uh, really cool, and uh, yeah, I mean. I guess you know you were telling me before that you're kind of behind the scenes, man. You're you're not the the, the you know I guess the uh, the public face of the free thought project. So it's just nice to see who's behind these big pages, you know. Sure, yeah. I don't think we have a public face. I think we're kind of maybe unique in that sense, where we just kind of let our content speak for us. But of course, we always get the occasional people emailing us and asking us who we are, and insisting to know our name so they could do some background tech checks so we're not working with the Koch brothers or uh, the Ford Foundation or wherever else they want to vilify at that moment in time, you know? But, right, right, right. Um, yeah, no, it's, I think for the most part, we just let the content do the speaking. We don't try to take any type of, uh, you know, faced for the fake Free Thought Project. Nice. Yeah, maybe that's my problem with my page because I have my ugly face on the front. So maybe that's why I'm, I don't have, I'm not up to a million likes right now. <laughs> maybe that's what's, <laughs> I gotta put, I gotta get some kind of nice logo and just put it up there. <laughs> yeah, maybe we could work on that, man. Maybe I could help you. Maybe we could uh, collaborate and create something. Yeah, but, uh, that'd, be, that'd be cool. Um, that might be one thing that's holding me back. <laughs> I think it works both ways, though, because you see people like Luke Radowski or other kind of big names mm. in the you know liber- well in the freedom movement, and right, right, right. truth movement, I guess, and it, it seems like they have such a huge following, you know, that they could almost kind of just ride, you know, off of that and. Not necessarily. I mean, not to mention We Are Change is huge, but like, it's just a good thing, I guess, if also if he was ever to get arrested or any kind of fallout, you know, legally, I mean, you'd have like a huge, you know, support group behind him. And with us, I think it'd be a little bit different. Like uh, Jason from the Three Free Thought Project got arrested. You know, I don't know if there'd be the same outcry and oh, people man. interested. <laughs> and I don't take that personally. It's just we haven't put our face out there. So, you know, I guess... But you, you, but, you, but you but you got you got the self for, uh the self four one one right app on your phone. Uh, we don't have that. No. What? Uh, you um, serious? I, I've, heard, I've heard a lot about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's actually a long, complicated story. I don't oh. know if I really want to touch on that. Okay, but, no uh, problem. No problem. 
had a little bit of a uh, falling out with cop lock, let's say uh, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, hmm. So I, I know there's some good people within cop lock and I don't want to say anything bad about that organization, but uh, one of the, the people who was currently a part of the cop lock family during that time, I guess is the guy who probably also founded 411 and uh, sell 411. And, you know, I, I should probably just let things go and reach out to him to, you know, see what we could do with police, the police as well. But I, I guess there's still a little bit of bad blood there. So <laughs> haven't really adopted that. Wait, that so you, are you, you're you referring to Virgil? Virgil. Vir- yeah. Oh, I didn't know he was uh, affiliated with the, with the cop blog. Okay. He, well, for a little while he was, he was posting on there with his truth voice uh, page. And okay. It's kind of a long, complicated story. It doesn't really even involve me. That's the most like All right, no disheartening problem. part about it, you know. But it's kind of our organization, so it's like, yeah, we, we don't try to fling mud, and we don't really try to have any drama or right. issues with people. So we kind of just steer clear, and yeah. that's probably more than I've said about it to anyone, to be honest. Wow. All right, <laughs> I, am, I am honored, and uh, I guess that's the first time most people have heard of uh, libertarian infighting, right? We never, we never get that, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i wish to say that wasn't the case but and and that's the thing that's what we were trying to avoid was the infighting so right. we just kind of disassociated and that's kind of why we chose the you know freedom of association not yeah. to associate right, with right. 411 right. i appreciate the idea there was another app uh a couple years ago um that was very similar called peacekeeper peacekeeper right. remember that yeah, one yeah cody drummond didn't, yeah yeah right didn't quite take off i right. guess hopefully virgil's having a little bit more success with this one right um but yeah yeah, I uh, I actually interviewed both both of those guys, and uh, yeah, pretty awesome dudes. And I I love helping people spread the message, um, you know, who are developing technology like that because I think that's really uh, the best way to um, render the state obsolete. Right? Is to absolutely is to um, just make technology that 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 it just it shows its backwardness and it's right. <laughs> you know sure no absolutely yeah I would say that's. One of the many probably growing technologies that are going to eventually, you know, make the state obsolete. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. It sounds like it seems like it's going to be eventually the age of transparency. And, you know, it seems like right now is the age of information. Um, it seems like probably within the next 20 years, uh, it's going to be impossible for corporations, governments, whoever to kind of get away with some of the same shit they've been getting away with this entire time, because there's going to be multiple ways of fact checking of looking at reviews for certain products and services for uh, all those things, you know, critiques of all sorts. So it's just going to be more and more transparent, I think anyway, as time goes on. So that's just another one of the many beauties of technology, you know, and yeah, it's uh, a wonderful thing. So beautiful. Well, unless unless you meet an anarcho primitivist, then then he's gonna <laughs> <laughs> sure he's gonna, he's gonna rail against the state and civilization. Like, oh man, you serious? <laughs> yeah, let's. Yeah, I don't know. I I'm very confused still about a lot of that. I mean, I guess I could kind of understand some of the idea of maybe technology, not even technology, just mo- modern society, maybe losing some of its apathy towards. Uh, environmental causes but it doesn't seem to be like rampant and widespread and it seems like it's usually way more blown out and you know taken out of proportion as the amprims usually like to look at and focus on you know so um yeah to me it's kind of silly uh it's i don't know definitely not my cup of tea i haven't seen enough justin stout posts to really uh jump on board or anything so <laughs> he's a good guy as far as i'm concerned he's always been cool with me i don't have any problems with justin stout but uh right it's yeah just i, I haven't been influenced at all yeah. people who blame like you know civilization for let's say climate change you know global warming um i don't know tsunamis um you know nuclear meltdown radiation all this kinds of stuff um i think they kind of miss the idea that you are much more likely to be um, injured or killed by, by an agent of the state than you are by radiation or tsunami. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, it's insane, the statistics. I mean, no, there's plenty of statistics out there of how you could be killed by a cop, like the percentage of right. different things. And, right. um, you know, there's 58 more times likely to be killed by a cop than a terrorist. And that's just one of the, the many statistics, you know, so... I agree. It seems kind of backwards to me. I mean, maybe there's some uh, 
other psychological issues going on there. Maybe he just has a, you know, a thing for camping and outdoors. And so he thinks <laughs> that maybe, uh, you know, technology capitalism is a little too intrusive on people's lives. I mean, I, I try not to discredit people for their beliefs. I actually really try to absorb uh, some some of the information and really try to just understand where they're coming from and their perspective. You know, I think that's important instead of just, you know, being dogmatic and dismissing anything that sounds just even a little crazy to you or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's just so many wonderful things going on with technology. I mean, yes, it's moving very fast and, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen in even the next 20 years. I mean, it seems like even in the last Last 30 years, things have changed dramatically. But, uh, you know, Elon Musk tells us we're going to be going to Mars and by mm. 2020 and uh, <laughs> we're going to have a neural lace in our brain, which apparently is going to be kind of like a built in AI. And uh, this is just his predictions, predictions, of course. So who knows what the validity is? But it, it seems interesting to think about. It's definitely exciting. And who knows if we want to go in that realm exactly. But um, it's it's just fascinating and interesting to think about because you know a lot of that technology is going to be used for beneficial purposes for humanity you know so yeah yeah and uh, you know technology itself is is amoral right it's neutral sure. it's not evil or it's not good right it's just a tool used by people to improve their lives or you know to hurt people <laughs> to like drones like computers like cars sure. like guns Firearms, right so these, yeah. these are all just tools right and and uh, you know so and same thing with money too. <laughs> a lot of people vilify money. Um, yeah, so absolutely. so yeah. So really, the um, I mean the the whole thing hinges upon um, what are we going to use it for, right? So it's not like I don't see I don't foresee a Terminator two you know you know machines take over the world and destroy humanity type of thing. Um, but I, I, I definitely, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm hopeful for the future. I think things are getting better. You know, crime is going down. Um, sure. um, you know, infant mortality is is decreasing, and long more people are living longer lives, healthier lives. Uh, we're mm. safer, you know, than sure. and, and we're more comfortable. We live in more luxury than like the majority of the people in the past. So. I would say it's safe to say that more people are waking up to with just the, the information that we have at our fingertips. And, you know, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice, you know, and many people are starting to understand that any question could be answered literally by Google in enough research time. Uh, you might not get 100% most accurate answer, mm -hmm. but you'll get somewhere in the ballpark and you can use your own discernment to kind of put the puzzle pieces together and find out of the truth that kind of sits well with you. Uh, and hopefully there's some, you know, truth there, objective truth, and uh, also some methodology behind it and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think it's it's only going to be a matter of time. And like I said, until the age of information kind of shifts into the age of transparency, I can't, I can't foresee it being any other way at this point. I mean, even just the past four and a half years now that I've been doing my Facebook pages, I could tell you there's been a dramatic change and uh, uh, the amount of likes and the amount of people who are commenting and actually engaging with posts and people who you could tell are still in their kind of uh, beginning stages of what we kind of joke around as the wake up sheeple phage stages, you know, <laughs> where it's just wake up, wake up. And you could see that and they go from there to the anger phase. And then a lot of people, you know, hopefully don't stop climbing the mountain of enlightenment at that point and still kind of continue to try to learn and build on their beliefs and their philosophies, but uh, I could personally say for sure that it, there's been a dramatic increase, and that's just looking at social media, you know, um, and of course going to a few festivals and conferences here and there that I, I try to go to, but I mean, and there's people, a lot, plenty of people who have been doing this a lot longer have been saying the same thing, that it's, it seems like there is a shift happening, and especially I think it's even more expedited with the whole Hillary uh, Trump debacle and so many people are so disillusioned with these two choices. I mean, I, I felt kind of disillusioned with Romney and Obama, but uh, I guess to many people, Obama still seemed like a more legitimate choice, whereas Clinton and Trump just seem completely like the wrong uh, choices for America. And I think a lot of Americans recognize that and are starting to kind of reach out. And I think that might be a start, part of the reason why the Free Thought Project is reaching so many people right now is that people are hungry for this type of information and they don't know exactly where to get it from and how to put all the pieces together, but they kind of have seeds planted here and there and they're starting to kind of put all put it, put it all together. And so I, it's an exciting time. 
it's definitely an exciting time. And we're, we're all a part of it. You know, you're doing your thing. I mean, everybody's doing their thing. And there's so many different facets. You know, people are doing art, people are doing music, people are doing, you know, social media side of things, people are writing books. I mean, there's, everybody's kind of coming together for this, this, and it's, it's awesome. It really is kind of a wonderful time to be alive. <laughs> oh, yeah, it definitely is. You said so many things I want to, I want to respond to, but um, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me first hear from your, your history and, uh, you know, how you came to this idea of, of uh, this radical idea of that we should all live in a voluntary manner. <laughs> How dare you think like sure, that? Sure, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's funny, I, I uh, was thinking about this question a little bit earlier, uh, and I think it kind of starts from um, my upbringing in the Bay Area and the, the town that I actually moved back to um, a couple of years ago, which is Santa Cruz, California. Um, kind of a counterculture mentality around here. And uh, I kind of embraced that through the music scene. I started kind of picking up on punk rock and hardcore music. And uh, that was kind of my thing in my teens and all throughout high school. I got involved with bands and started playing in bands. And I was kind of doing some various disobedient stuff as a kid, which in retrospect is kind of funny to think about. Um, just a quick story. They were uh, there, I lived in a small town. It was outside of Santa Cruz, actually. And it was like a little small valley. And we liked to skateboard and the only place in the entire valley to skateboard that had a lot of concrete that was flat and a couple of things that you could maybe try to grind or whatever was the high school. So they put out this huge uh, memo and they actually had security guards um, after about a year of us skating there, try to close down the high school at after hours. So we couldn't skate there anymore. And so we kind of had this big disobedience where we went there for a few nights in a row and we put up all these flyers everywhere. We taped them everywhere saying, let us skate. And it's kind of funny to think about it now. Like I was this kind of entitled like punk rock kid, like trying to let them, I mean, it was a public school. So in some ways it's like, Oh, I guess they maybe should have let us skate there. Yeah. But eventually I guess our efforts did pay off. And uh, you know, a few years later, about a year and a half later when I was already done with high school, they ended up building a little skate park within the little town and everything. So ah, it actually nice. turned out to be kind of a good thing. I can't say I took all the credit for that, obviously, <laughs> but it was, uh, you know, and so there's just kind of little things that have been kind of sprinkled throughout my history. When I look back at it, I was kind of activist minded. And I think I kind of did embrace also the counter current, uh, the counter culture, um, mentality, you know, trying to question authority, question the mainstream and stuff like that. But uh, like I said, I got really interested in music, um, ended up moving up to San Francisco and was playing music up there for a while with a few uh, bands and ended up doing some touring and wrote some records. And uh, I was actually working for a nonprofit up there called Forest Forever, which was an um, environmental group trying to protect public forest lands from logging. So I kind of always have had this in my background, but just not really like identified like where I stood, didn't really do a lot of research as far as my philosophy and beliefs and whatnot. But uh, that all kind of changed. I moved down to Los Angeles and um, ended up going to recording an audio engineering school down there because I was, I was so interested in music. I kind of had a, what I call my quarter life crisis when I turned 25. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm working to five and I hate it. And what am I going to do with myself? What am I going to do with my life? And so I kind of panicked. Uh, I went to Los Angeles and went to a recording school, which turned out to be a diploma mill. Funny to talk about technology. Um, I was always broke, you know, but I had saved up a few months, a few bucks to buy an iPad. So right around the Wall, uh, Occupy Wall Street time period. I had uh, started paying attention a little bit more. I was playing around with my iPad, just kind of looking at news more often than I would. And it's funny that the technology always gets so demonized because like for me in this instance, it was kind of what got me interested in kind of paying attention a little bit more. Uh, so anyway, I started paying attention and saw a lot of the police brutality um, at Occupy Wall Street. That was the first time I really saw it as a parent as it is nowadays. And you know, and even in 2011, it was, it was pretty heavy handed. Um, and so at that point, it let a fuse inside of me. I knew somehow I needed to get involved. I needed to do something, even if it was just part time, uh, whatever it could be that I could do, I needed to get involved. And I also knew specifically I wanted to get involved with police, police activism just because fuck that shit. Like that pissed me off. I saw police throwing people, slamming old women, uh, little kids. I mean, they were totally indiscriminate with their violence and just a bunch of thugs. And to me, I still kind of, you know, hazy as far as my beliefs went. And so I was kind of thinking, 
this is supposed to be America. Like, this should not be happening. This, these are peaceful protesters. And at the time, there were people that kind of looked like me, you know, kind of these 20-something hipster-looking people who are maybe not exactly accurate with some of their ideology. But one, one way or another, they were getting out there and protesting and actually doing something rather than just sitting around and not taking any control or power over the situation, you know. And so that kind of inspired me. Um, I would say that only lasted about a couple of weeks until I saw uh, somehow, I guess, through those veins, like a Ron Paul video. And uh, just like many other people, that kind of took me down a rabbit hole. Um, while I was kind of learning about Ron Paul, I was still kind of waking up. I, I didn't quite consider myself a libertarian yet. Um, I was kind of getting more uh, interested in, in the food safety, food, uh, excuse me, the food, food health side of things with like Monsanto and GMOs and whatnot. So I got kind of heavy into, um, at the time, what was Prop 37. Uh, for California, which was labeling the GMOs. And of course, you know, once again, I didn't really have some of my foundation at that point. So to me, that sounded like a good thing to try to limit uh, the GMOs that were being put out there. And um, I still have kind of mixed feelings about GMOs. I'm definitely anti-labeling, of course, anything the state. But, uh, you know, I, at that time, it was something that I felt passionate about. And I actually got involved with March Against Monsanto and tried to help them out and uh, did some graphics and whatnot for them. But the more I kept reading uh, and looking into Ron Paul, the more things started to kind of make sense. I started kind of putting pieces together for myself. Um, I kind of, you know, naturally within the circles that we have, you know, Ron Paul led to Tom Woods, Jeffrey Tucker, uh, Stefan Molyneux, Adam Kokesh, these people. And things just, like I said, became more and more obvious that I was going in the right direction. It wasn't just like there was a general vilification of just some group of people like banksters or capitalism or whatever, like there's actually some philosophy behind it. So um, that was kind of where I started to kind of think twice about libertarianism as well, uh, especially after seeing the 2012 election and seeing Prop 37 uh, defeated you know, there was there was no way that that was going to pass. I put a lot of effort to petition and try to do work for that. And so between the, the waking up towards the philosophy and then the actual just seeing the state fail and and realizing that a lot of the libertarian minarchist perspective wasn't necessarily morally consistent um, and that the deep state was so embedded into our lives that anything working within the system and trying to vote just seemed like futile and just kind of like an empty effort, you know? So I, um, I think at that point kind of started to embrace, uh, anarchism a little bit more volunteerism. Um, and you know, I'm still learning. It's always a learning process. I'm sure as you are, there's still so many facets to learn about all these different, um, things when it comes to anarcho capitalism and volunteerism. And there's so many wonderful pro pro prolific writers and people who touch on these subjects that it's still kind of, something I can't say that I'm hundred percent solidified with my knowledge. I mean, I don't know if anybody ever is even like a Murray Rothbard or whatever, but it's, I feel like has more substance and more value to my life and it applies to my beliefs and resonates with me more so than any other, other ideology. And it's more morally consistent and pragmatically consistent as far as just being able to work, you know, um, we so, see so many failures within the, the government and a lot of times those kind of boil down to incentives and lack of incentives, you know? And so it seems like the more I learn about markets and market functions and how things work as far as money and whatnot, I mean, it, it seems like there is a reason why we have, even though there has been influence from the state gravitated towards a capitalist society and it has been so beneficial for humanity, you know? And so, uh, it's been a wonderful process. I really, I mean, especially now to be working with the Free Thought Project. I mean, we're, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we have 1.3 million fans now. Uh, we've this this week alone, we've uh, reached 41 million people. Um, we had 62,000 new likes this week. So it's just been a <laughs> amazing <laughs> adventure and journey for me. This whole waking up process. I feel very empowered personally. I feel like I took my my life from being in this position of working a nine to five that I hated uh, to being in a position now where I could work my own hours as much as I want to. Uh, and I do something that I love and I care about. 
So I end up not the, and here's the best part, obviously, is that we're preaching the message of peace and love and uh, and anarchism, you know. So it's it's honestly I couldn't be any happier as far as that kind of stuff goes, my career and whatnot. <laughs> so so Jason, I, I feel pretty confident in saying that um, you didn't earn those likes, um, and, and so I'm going to have to petition the state to redistribute your likes. Um. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> We try to do our own redistribution. We try to help out <laughs> smaller organizations. And you didn't build that. <laughs> right. I love that. <laughs> that was a good one. That needs to, that meme campaign needs to come back. There was a lot of good memes that came out of that yeah. Obama quote. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, that's beautiful hearing your journey. I love I love hearing people's journeys. It's amazing how, you know, different avenues we all came in. And um, I also was uh, brought in through the nutrition, vaccines, GMOs, Monsanto. Um, right. And because uh, I'm an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. So I, I, right. I was very interested in holistic nutrition as a as a teenager. And I did a lot of reading into that and the Gerson therapy and alternative cancer therapies in general. Sure. And right. so, uh, yeah, so I, uh, I remember I was uh, subscribed to this one website called Farm Wars and, uh, her, her major bent was that we need to ban, not only label GMOs, we need to ban GMOs. Mm-hmm. And at the time I'm like, Hmm, you know, I guess that sounds like a good idea. But, uh, later, you know, the more I learn about economics and the state and, uh, uh, you know, like you said, incentives, um, you understand that, you know, maybe empowering a monopoly on violence is not a good idea. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah. Putting guns in pe- peaceful people's faces, I mean, that's not really uh, a moral, uh, just society, you know, and, and we see that with the drug war. And it, it's, yeah, it's definitely insane uh, that we've come to this place in our society where people still believe that prohibition and, yeah, enacting violence, initiating violence on peaceful people who have broken these, you know, these quote unquote laws. And that's completely acceptable. And I think it's just another sign that, you know, we've been dumbed down to a certain extent. And we've also uh, just let our apathy completely you know, take over our sense of empathy, I guess, you know, and trying to to relate to the people who are in these situations. I mean, it's easy to use some of the political talk and the sophistry, you know, to make these huge promises on how you're going to eliminate drugs and take out drug dealers and whatnot. But when it's a, an innocent veteran who's, you know, came back from Iraq war or whatever, I mean, is it really as consistent as like the, the politicians are really leading on because, you know, they have a plant in their in their their bedroom or whatever i mean is that something that we should initiate violence for and for somebody who's basically being peaceful i mean they're not hurting anybody they're not initiating violence on anybody else you know it's insane how we've and I, we keep saying we and i know it's a very collective term but uh america as a you know country has kind of let that happen and i mean i think a lot of this happened before we were even born i mean the drug war started in 1971 you know so people kind of turned a blind eye to that a long time ago and now it's become something that's just accepted I mean, to yeah. a certain extent, a lot of yeah. people are speaking out and upset about it too. Banning something has so many implications. Like first, you're following, you're empowering the state. Second of all, what's the history of prohibition, and is that is that ever successful? <laughs> and when, when does that when does that not ever create a black market, right? right. And more criminals, <laughs> and more sure. crime, and more violence. Like it just worsens the situation. And and so this woman from this website, uh, you know, I remember reading how, you know, we have to ban it because, you know, cross contamination and it's going to contaminate all the crops and all the crops going to be, um, horrible and toxic and we're all going to (laughs) die and there's no way out and we have to ban it. Um, and, um, and, and I've been thinking about it after I, I learned more about how harmful prohibition is and I'm thinking, you know, Hmm. So, I mean, the way I look at GMOs right now is like a biological cul-de-sac, right? It's like, you know, we do make these, let's say, terminator genes, uh, terminator crops, or um, you know, uh, resistant to certain pesticides. Um, but I don't see something like that as being ecologically viable. Like, I think it will self-destruct. I don't think it's going to propagate and like and like contaminate every single plant on Earth and like <laughs> destroy us all. I don't see that happening at all. Um, right. So yeah. So if, if something has to be created in the laboratory. And then it gets released into the wild. I think it's just going to die of its own accord in the wild. <laughs> Nature is a pretty brutal, pretty brutal person. <laughs> Very true. I guess on the flip side is we don't know, and a lot of this technology is still so new that right. like we don't really know the implications. And I right. think that's probably my main stance when I was 
you know, doing the March against Monsanto thing is just like, how do you put the toothpaste back in the tube once right. it's out? Or, mm. and I mean, I'm sure there's many sayings that kind of are similar to that, but right, right. Uh, it's, you know, one of those things. And it's so hard to get real legitimate information. I mean, obviously everything's kind of swayed and influenced by different money and the biotechnology industry is financing the studies. Then how do we know right. how legitimate it is? And then there's the opposite, polar opposite, where it's like, you know, the groups like uh, March against Monsanto and, you know, they put out their own type of information and it tends to be biased so i think you know once again it's just about using your own discernment and kind of trying to find what resonates and actually seems accurate to you sometimes that's a little out of our spectrum as far as like science science and whatnot but i think we could kind of come to our own conclusions and still have them be somewhat accurate without needing to know a lot of that and i would go back to my other point about um you know the threat of dying from radiation or climate change or global warming as being you know the threat of dying from gmo poisoning in that you know you are more likely to die from an agent of the state sure. than from gmos so if you're really afraid for your life you gotta get some priorities straight okay right you should be yeah. an anarchist it's just that outdated mentality of you know the state is our protector right. we are the government right. you know i mean that was probably their most successful propaganda technique was to convince uh the majority of Americans that we are the government because, you know, once you give that people that that kind of identity and that almost belief is of, of a responsibility, they almost take it personally. And well, yeah, of course I have to vote. And of course, this is my obligation. Of course, this is what we're doing as the government. And mm -hmm. I think that was one thing that I really learned from Stefan Molyneux is to kind of distinguish, I mean, the line between the two. I mean, the state, it's its own entity, you know, and we, we aren't the state. I mean, uh, if that was the case, were the Jews voting themselves into concentration camps? I mean, I, I know Rothbard makes that point, you know, and it it's, it's, seems valid to me, you know, I mean, we're not, we're not, it's a completely different, different entity, but at the same time, it is just an illusion. It's just a, a label that people wrap around themselves to have the opposite rights that we do or they claim to anyway they don't really but they claim to have the opposite rights so. <laughs> yeah 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 recently i've been um I, I like to describe um that i'm against statism and the belief in authority and not necessarily against the state and government because it doesn't sure. really exist like you said like it's like saying i'm against the tooth fairy or santa claus uh or the easter bunny right um, it's just a belief. It's a belief that some people have the exemption to morality that other people do not, right? It's just men and women with guns forcing you to pay them, as Mark Stevens would say. And so I think we have to dispense with this idea that this is the government, you know, and this is us. This is we, That's the state, and this is private individuals. No, they're just people believing that they have moral exemption, right? That right. they can steal and call it taxation. They can... They can uh, kidnap you and call it the war on drugs, right? They can murder people overseas and call it the war on terror. And for some reason, um, these political euphemisms um, are okay and acceptable when they say it. <laughs> sure. Uh, Kinsella makes a great point as well, and I've been trying to kind of adhere to this just to just try to be as accurate as possible, but he always makes the point that government could be a group of people. It could be your church. It could be a government who is a local body of people who are just concerned about you know, whatever it may be. So I think the state is probably a little more accurate in that sense, you know, because, it, yeah, government could be, it doesn't necessarily mean they claim the, the right to initiate force and, mm, right. you know, claim the right to initiate taxation for uh, law enforcement and law, you know, and all those things would be a, a monopoly on those things, you know. So there is a little bit of a, dis a distinguishing factor there. And uh, those are things I think that you start to realize more when you start to get into a little bit more libertarian theory and you can recognize that. I feel like that's still things that our friends from the left just can't grasp. They don't see how the state is a monopoly. And I feel like that's one thing that I always try to use against them because they always tend to look at monopolies as being a bad thing as far as big business goes. I mean, obviously, they didn't want to see a monopoly. Nobody wants to see a monopoly with certain products and services. But when it comes to the government being a monopoly, nobody seems to have any problem with that. <laughs> like, how does that right. work? You know what I mean? Like, uh, no, it, it is a problem, especially when we look at law and law enforcement. You know, I mean, they claim to be uh, the final arbiters in all cases of conflict, including cases involving themselves. How the fuck is that not a huge red flag to people? You know what I mean? Like, how is that legitimate in any way? How is that not a conflict of interest? And how come people don't recognize this? You know what I mean? And I feel like to me, 
whenever we talk about, I, I mean, I'm always answering comments and we're talking to people on police, the police and whatnot. To me, I feel like that's the, the point I try to hammer home the most is that it's a monopoly. Like how will you ever expect any type of legitimate results, just results from a monopoly who claims the right to, mm. you know, arbitrate mm. its own conflicts. Like that just doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> See, if Coca-Cola poisoned some people and then people like bring lawsuits against Coca-Cola and then Coca-Cola's court, <laughs> it was owned by Coca-Cola. The judge works for Coca-Cola. The lawyers, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the bailiff, the officers work for Coca-Cola. Would you think that that's a, a, a an impartial system? <laughs> You know, as, as much as I appreciate a lot of people waking up to the police state, I just feel like there are certain aspects that, and I guess it, it all kind of goes back to public schools and, you know, the, the whole process of thinking that the state is great and that government is just. And if we didn't have these parameters put in place by government, that there would just be nothing that would ever take its place. And I think that's what a lot of people think is that if we didn't have police, there would just be utter chaos. They don't realize that they're when they say this and they support and endorse the police that they're supporting and endorsing a monopoly. They don't ever think twice about, uh, you know, I don't want to say the word private because that also has its own negative connotations, but just any type of security companies mm -hmm. or uh, people who actually would have incentive to, to run a business that would actually produce results, desirable results for society rather than these undesirable results that we see day in and day out. I mean, I've seen my fair share of police brutality videos, trust me. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it's funny when, if you do bring that up and say it, you'll immediately get, you know, the Blackwater comparisons and, you know, these private police and the people, like I said, it just conjures up all these crazy ideas of private, you know, that word private is such a trigger word. Nobody who within, you know, with outside of the libertarian circles understands that private is actually a good thing and that mm. it just means that people control it rather than the government. I think that's probably one of the biggest, yeah, things that we try to, to focus on is is the fact that the police is a monopoly and same thing with the courts, you know, that's... Yeah, 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 like like how often do you see um, brutality uh, conducted by mall cops Right, or or yeah. by bouncers. <laughs> sure. As Walter Bloch likes to point out, Disneyland, you know, you don't right. see, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, D Daffy, Daffy Duck or, or Donald Duck, excuse me, you know, blessing people, <laughs> harassing, and br brutalizing people and stuff. You know, I mean, they have private security there. It's just they, it's behind the scenes. Nobody sees it. If there's an incident, it happens so quietly that nobody, it's not like a big fuss. It's not on the news or people aren't being shot and killed and. You know, I mean, it's it's crazy. And I think ultimately what it kind of boils down to, once again, is just that people simplify everything. They want a simple answer. They want a simple solution. Uh, it kind of boils down to, I think, state-sponsored schools, you know, these indoctrination camps. I mean, we aren't taught critical thinking. Nobody ever wants to deep dive into these subjects and really try to understand them and dissect them. Um, a lot of times they're just trying to get the, the quickest answer, quick the quickest way they could point their finger and scapegoat a certain group or a certain aspect or whatever. And I, like I was saying, I think that's just one thing that's a little disheartening, uh, maybe with the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, there's a few things that are disheartening with the Black Lives Matter movement, but a lot of people as well who are waking up to the police state is it's just, you know, they don't, they're not really putting the, the pieces together as far as what the culprits are. Yes, racism exists. Does the, the war on drugs give life to racism? Does, does it, does it actually empower police to be racist more so than they would be without the war on drugs? Yes, in my opinion. And do people talk about that? Is that what the Black Lives Matter group is focusing on? Is that something that they have within their parameters of focus? I mean, is that something that they're even interested in? I don't think so. I mean, I, 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 I hear very little about the, the drug war, ending the drug war. Hopefully with Police the Police, I think that's you know what we're trying to do as well with the Free Thought Project is we're just always trying to interject um, a lot of the different theory, a lot of these things that kind of get swept under the rug, whether it be because they're not exactly popular or because it just takes two levels of logic, you know, one of two kind of getting past that first one, putting the pieces together. A lot of people don't want to get to that second level of logic. They don't have, they don't feel like it's important, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what we're trying to do. And I think we do, I think we make it we try to blend it pretty well because at the same time, if you do that too much and you just kind of uh, speak terminology and you kind of provide information to, to people that it's kind of foreign to them. And 
I think it's important to kind of balance it out and put enough of a mix of information and topics that people kind of already have an understanding about and then kind of put like a twist on it or plant seeds more or less with the type of information they're already used to absorbing. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the police and courts, you know, what it boils down to is is you don't really think that the police are necessary because what exactly do they do, right? Supposedly they provide protection and security, right? They don't they don't need to be part of the government to, pro- to provide protection and security. You can get that sure. from other types of agencies and what does the court system do arbitrate disputes right dispute right. resolution you don't need to be part of the government to dispute <laughs> to arbitrate disputes right you can right. do that you can do that privately through an agencies and and it's all about incentives right if 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 somebody uh relies on their paycheck on voluntary transaction and uh and purchases then they're going to treat you different than if they're going to get paid no matter how they treat <laughs> how they treat sure. you when you make something um that is um by default you know mandatory payment um you're going to definitely get different behavior right that's just how humans act that's how humans uh, react yeah no absolutely that's you know the biggest the biggest problem is that yeah they are paid through taxation and uh one of the biggest problems i've probably named about 3 already but uh, <laughs> it's 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 one of the biggest problems because yeah it, it it definitely doesn't give them any incentive to be accountable to the public. And we mm. see this day after day when every time a police union or a police chief gets up there to kind of feed us lines of bullshit <laughs> that they even know is bullshit, but they have to, because if they actually tell the truth, it would be a problem and they're, it, the house of cards would crumble, you know? So they always have to kind of give the narrative that they are, they are trying, they are investigating themselves. They are keeping, they are appeasing the public, but uh, more often than not, it's an outright lie. They know it. Um, I can't think of any examples, specific examples right now. But I mean, there's anytime you watch a police chief, you could just see the lies straight through their teeth. I mean, it's almost borderline Hillary. I mean, a lot of times they could probably a lot of these police chiefs give Hillary a run for her money as far as how much they lie. You know. <laughs> yeah, I love I love the uh, I love the the memes. You know, you always see under the <laughs> under, under the police brutality videos. You know, you always get one guy posting the meme of uh, we conducted an internal investigation <laughs> and we found ourselves to be innocent of any wrongdoing <laughs> right right <laughs> there's another version of that there's actually like a group of people and like we the people have found ourselves not guilty have <laughs> been people. waiting it's like one of those special opportunity memes to kind of use you know in the graphic <laughs> comments but <laughs> uh, yeah you know that that idea that um you know the state is um is us you know it's just a it's just a group of people getting together and getting things done doing things and it's a, it's a society it's a community of people um, I get that all the time from uh, a lot of Bernie supporters um, because a lot of leftists, they you know have this very uh, warm, fuzzy feeling mentality about the state. Like you know, like mm-hmm. you said, it's our protector, it's our mother, right. it's our father. It's just it's there. It keeps us safe. You know, it's like it's like a pillow. It's like a nice warm blanket. You know, <laughs> it just keeps me safe. <laughs> sure, a nice warm blanket with bombs and knives and guns underneath, but it it keeps you safe. <laughs> Well, we just we just don't pay attention to all the killing of the brown people in the Middle East and, you know, the yeah. highest incarceration rate in the world. I mean, right. you know, those things are just yeah, we don't pay attention to those. Cause right. And who and, knows why? And the other thing I say to people like that is, um, you know, oh, yeah, because I, I get from some people like that. They say, um, well, it's just like a condominium board. You know, it's like you're living in a, in a condo complex and. And you're just paying rent, right? That's taxation. You're your rent, you know, for living in a condo complex, and they're the board, <laughs> or, yeah. or or it's like a chess club. It's just like a chess club, you know. People are in charge of the chess club, and people go to the chess. Club. That that's all it is. And I'm like, so so are you saying that when when condo um, associations uh, get into disputes with other condo associations, do they wage war and send their tanks and <laughs> <laughs> drone bomb them? <laughs> Or right. how about this? Do they print their own money and then force people to to pay in it and then devalue it? <laughs> I mean, there's so many examples. We could probably be here all night thinking of yeah different examples. I think just the the fact and it it kind of goes back to like the whole social contract, right? Like I didn't I don't remember ever signing anything. I don't think you did. If anybody who's watching this could actually provide a social contract that they've signed. Please message me, email it to me, because uh, I'd love to see it. I honestly would. I don't think uh, I don't think that's possible because they don't exist. Apparently, just being born within within the you know geographical territory of the United States just means that you're 
already akin to this social contract. And it means that, yeah, one way or another, you are their property. And uh, you you did agree, apparently, you know. Uh, so apparently you didn't realize it. When you were born, you did agree to all these contracts, just like the housing board is just trying to tell, you know, what's right and what's wrong. But no, it's, it's all bullshit. And that's the thing, like the more that people dive into a lot of, once again, I think the libertarian perspective, because that's more or less the group that does kind of recognize the state to be illegitimate, you see that it's all just bullshit. I mean, it is. I mean, you can't even find any type of hard proof that taxation is legitimate. You know what I mean? I mean, they, they claim it's it's voluntary. I mean, I've heard and read so many different things. <laughs> and apparently, you know, people tell me I had I have this guy message me. And I mean, he's he's going through all these different tax documents. And he, he's claiming that, I mean, it just doesn't it doesn't exist. It's not legitimate whatsoever. And I know our friend uh, Larkin Rose has also had plenty of issues with the IRS and actually did some time, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, tax issues. I mean, it's and, you know, it obviously gives him even more grounds and empowers him even more to speak on a lot of the issues that he does talk on. Yeah, it, it's just such it's mind blowing. It really is mind blowing. And I think it really just goes back to that group mentality, that group think mentality of, uh, yeah, the state is our protectors. Um, you know, it's, we are just one big, happy national family. And yes, we have some crazies and, you know, some problems and hiccups here and there. But I it. To me, it's so hard to grasp, and I think I've never, ever really had the mentality of a status because it just seems so foreign to me, you know? Like, it seems like it's, it, it is just this whole get along, go along to get along mentality. And uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say I was born with a natural understanding of natural rights, but I almost kind of do feel like it's always just been this very strange kind of alien idea to me that we're supposed to bow down and you know give our lives over to the state to be killed for these pointless wars and like that's supposed to be something that's respected and admirable and noble and i remember from a very young age just thinking well they're fucking crazy i'm glad it's not me i guess if people want to do that with themselves like go for it but like that's not me you know what i mean and i don't know if that necessarily has anything to do with being a coward as much as it does just being logical and recognizing that the state is its own entity and a cult more or less as adam kokesh likes to say i mean it's my status friends are going to hate hearing this but it is a death cult i mean more or less you know what i mean and if you look at the the same attributes to religion and a lot of uh, factors of cults i mean a lot of the same things that you know uh, statism is founded on and beliefs in statism would apply perfectly with religious beliefs and tenets, you know, so it's, uh, I don't know. It is crazy to think that so many people are so deeply indoctrinated into this cult that it, we're the weird ones, you know, like we're the outsiders, we're the extremists because we do, we do believe in peace and we don't believe in these, you know, initiation of force. And Jason, uh, Jason, Jason, I think, I think you're just not thinking this through enough. All right. If we just get the right person in power, all right, right. things will just yeah. fall into place. All right. <laughs> Cheers to that. Yeah. <laughs> Gary Johnson. <laughs> you know, um, and, and you, by the way, you did sign the social contract in amniotic fluid. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you falling out of your mother's hoo-ha was oh, the signature. Jesus. That was, that was the signature. <laughs> Oh, boy. Yeah, and it just goes to show, like, all the bullshit they try to tell you. I, I don't know. I mean, it, they just kind of dig a hole for themselves as far as the explanation of all these things. And I, I don't know. It's crazy to me. It's crazy that people believe it. It's crazy to me that people adhere to it. It's people, crazy to me that people vote. It's crazy to me that people tell us that because we're not voting, uh, we're the problem, you know, and that we don't have any right to complain. I mean, where's where's the logic? Like Carlin said, <laughs> yeah, where's the logic yeah, in that? Exactly. <laughs> He's but, like, I think I think Carlin is like, I was home, like jerking off, and I did more good for society <laughs> than you did by going in there and pressing a button and for. imposing. <laughs> Yeah, I have something to show for it. And I, then you did pressing a button, imposing your beliefs onto somebody else. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you know. <laughs> It's, it's hard for me to even get excited about Gary Johnson, you know. I mean, Ron Paul was different, and to be honest, I did vote for Ron Paul. I did vote for Gary Johnson in 2012, but 
that was, you know, that was the last effort in my, you know, libertarian uh, mindset. And I just, I, it's really hard for me to get excited about Gary Johnson. I mean, I don't know how you feel about him, but like, he just seems like he's, just, he's a space case. He seems like he's exhausted and tired most of the time. He seems like he could barely put two sentences together. He doesn't have any kind of principles or like, you know, to me anyway, his philosophy is very, very thin. Um, I don't know. I mean, yes, he's a libertarian light, but I mean, how do you feel about him? Well, you know, he's a purist. You know, he, he's going to catapult us from here to An- Ancapistan. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <Yeah. laughs> no way. I don't, <laughs> I don't advocate anybody. All right? I tell sure. people, you want to improve the world, start with yourself. All right? Improve yourself. Make yourself a decent, moral, compassionate human being. Good point. And, and, and then if you want to improve other people maybe yeah like you know spread your ideas and maybe have kids and raise them to be decent moral compassionate human beings that's how you improve the world right be the example show people how to live how you want you know treat your friends how you want to see the future treat your kids how you want to see the future right sure. and and if you need to to go to a ballot or to a uh, or to a voting booth and forcefully impose your beliefs onto somebody else because you couldn't do it voluntarily, then you're a failure. <laughs> sure. What can I say? <laughs> you know, you have failed as a human being if you think that that's the only way to enact change. Sure. Right? No, I totally agree, man. You know, I I think that uh, there's <clears throat> the theory that some people have made that why Stefan Molyneux is kind of diverted from right. uh, the, the, the kind of previous audience that he was interested in and the information he was kind of interested in to more of like the Donald Trump and all right side of things is because uh, the libertarian community didn't really embrace his peaceful parenting um, as much as he had really wanted to. And he felt like that was one of the biggest solutions for change. And I do kind of feel his pain in that regard because and I know you're very big on peaceful parenting as well, but I mean, we already acknowledge that this is going to be an intergenerational shift. Mm. This isn't going to be something that we just vote our way out of. Mm. This isn't going to be something that happens in the next five years. People are, this is an evolution. You know, mm. people are need to come to the conclusion, a lot of the same philosophy and understandings that we've talked about and touched upon, even in this conversation. And that's only going to happen through the younger generations. I mean, yes, we could be the steward, of this message and this information, but ultimately it's going to be enacted and it's going to be embraced by the younger generation and masses. Once they kind of understand that a lot of these, you know, claims to authority is illegitimate from government and that there's just a better way of living and being in society. And it's just peaceful, the non-initiation of force, you know, the non-aggression principle. So I think, I think it's just a matter of time, and I really think it's a shame that we as uh, libertarians and voluntarists, anarchists, haven't done more to really spread the word as far as that goes. I know it's not as sexy and glamorous as some of the other tenets and things that we try to talk about, um, you know, taxation is theft and whatnot, because, and let's, let's face it, a lot of people aren't even parents you know and yeah, yeah. some people don't know how to necessarily apply some of these principles and ideas of peaceful parenting but mm. i think in in all reality and honesty that's going to be one of the best ways to transition into a peaceful world is by teaching our our kids that you know spanking is not acceptable the initiation of force is acceptable you know self-ownership hopefully when they get a little older they understand private property although a lot of kids tend to seem to already understand private property from a very young age i'm sure you can attest you know Yep, it's mine. I had it first. Um, uh, what, else, what else they say? That's not you know. You, but that's not what you said. You know. So so they have to understand the basic private property. Yeah, self ownership and contracts. Just by those <laughs> that you know. But you said right. So they hold people to their word. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and uh, yeah, I I think that uh, that children you know you, they emulate their parents right. So statism definitely begins at home. And um, and that's that's the main thing, and and then it's it gets propagated through the uh, through the government schools. But yeah, it's it's so important how we raise our kids because um, that will be the next you know generation. That will be the future, the world of tomorrow. And uh, you know you got to think how do you want to how do you want people to live? How, what kind of world do you want your kids to grow up in? You know, um, 
and uh, and yeah, so so I think peaceful parenting is so important. Homeschooling and unschooling um, yeah. is it, just is just so powerful. And uh, yeah, Stefan Mani was a major inspiration to me um, when uh, when I had my 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 son. We had our son in 2010. I heard the um, my wife sent me the video, the 17, 17 reasons why you should uh, not spank your kids. And that's you know my rabbit hole into stuff I'm all new stuff, um, <laughs> sure. and it's and it's great and um, and so yeah so it's uh, such a such a beautiful thing and so I I talk with a lot of homeschoolers about this stuff and so they are more amenable to everything else I say because they see how I am with my kids and that you know if you were to go up to somebody and say I'm an anarchist you know what's going to be the reaction right <laughs> but if they see sure. you know if they see you with kids if they see that you're peaceful if they see that you you know. You want to, you know, take your kids into nature and have them have a great time and and free play and things like that. And then you say, "And I'm an anarchist." They're like, "Oh, huh?" Sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? No, I think it's great, man. I think that's the probably the best way you could do it is, yeah, to kind of uh, display your behavior and the upright kind of person that you are first and foremost, and kind of mm-hmm. let people kind of a- a- acknowledge and accept that, and then slowly kind of figure out ways to plant seeds or even a lot of times just wait for them to say something that might be the perfect opportunity to be, well, have you ever thought about it like this or whatever, you know? And, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, you know, I, we, we talk about, a lot of people talk about change and looking for solutions and stuff, but I don't think enough people think about the long term, you know? And I think just like what we were talking about a few minutes ago about kind of keeping people kind of have this simplistic mindset about things. I think that kind of applies to, the short term as well. They just want to see a short term solution, a short term fix or whatever. But I think realistically, I mean, it, things, they take time. And uh, we, we live in a society that is a band aid society, that is a fast food society where, you know, we're always just trying to put a band aid on something and move on to the next. And, you know, we're, we're getting our information, our food, all these different things through memes, through fast food. We're, not taking the time to really examine what needs to be done. And I think you're right. I mean, uh, it, it takes a while, you know, so the more seeds we can plant and yeah, I think that's a wonderful thing. If you can influence, you know, the parents at the, the I think you said your daycare, right? No, no, no. It's like a homeschooling group. Like we meet up, oh, we oh. do various things, go to parks, oh, playgrounds wow. and hiking and mountain climbing and cooking outdoors and museums <laughs> sure well they're probably already kind of yeah yeah they're all like accepting naturally yeah against government schooling so it's just like you right. know just take the next step if the government can't do schooling right or sorry if the government can't do education right what sure. else do you think the government can't do <laughs> <laughs> you know um what do you think about schoolings like the waldorf and i know there's kind of other schools like Montessori schools and do, do those do those have much value? I mean yeah. I haven't really Yeah, I'm I'm uh, actually in contact with a lot of um people who send their kids there. Uh yeah, Waldorf, Montessori, there's also one near us called the Blue Rock um school and then yeah, I've heard of other things like the Free School and the Summer Hill School and uh and then there's one called the Sudbury Valley School. There's all these different kinds and they're very similar. You know, um, I guess like differences in philosophy, like people would say Rudolf Steiner with his Waldorf, you know, he's very strict about no technology, like no, um, you know, media, like, you know, iPads, iPods, TV, video mm-hmm. games, like, which is pretty strict. Um, but, you know, people like that. So they send. But I don't know. Personally, I don't think the money's worth it. <laughs> it's pretty mm-hmm. expensive. I'm right. like, I'm like, I just don't think, you know, to pay this institution thousands of dollars so that they can use, I don't know, um, beeswax, uh, you know, crayons. I don't know. <laughs> it's just not necessary. Like, if I want right. to use that, I'm going to buy that, you know. And and I think I can give my kid a good amount of um, of exposure to a lot of experiences myself just by me creating networks, meeting new people, and then saying, let's, you know, let's meet up. Let's do this. Let's do that. And so we've done a lot of things. Like, we, we just recently did, um, just last week, we did camping. First oh, time, nice. first time my, my kids did outdoor camping in a tent. Uh, great experience. And we, we, you know, we we all got food. We we split it and we we cooked. You know, one of the women, she's awesome with fire. She makes, she brings her own stove and and uh, cast iron pots, and she cooked food. Oh my god, it was delicious. You know, and then we went <laughs> no, hiking, right. and then then we went to a stream, and and all the kids found frogs, and we were like frog hunting, and that was fun. And I I caught a huge one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So that's great. It's now. Like, Getting kids involved and you know interested in the 
the forest and all that stuff and hiking and nature, I think is such a wonderful thing, especially at an early age, really, I think, uh, they, they adopt those, you know, uh, the attitudes where they, they try to appreciate it more, I guess. And maybe more so than a kid who's just lived in the suburbs or the city their entire life. (laughs) I I mean, I speak for, from experience, you know, I, I definitely have an appreciation for the forest and the mountains and environment and whatnot and i think that's a good thing i mean it doesn't mean i'm like a diehard green and i you yeah. know will spike trees and whatnot but uh it, it, i think it's important to have that type of perspective and sometimes i wonder if that's what the amprims are kind of going for you know is mm-hmm. just to kind of like appreciate nature a little bit more than yeah. we do but some of them seem so visual and hardline about it you right, know right, it's right. like ah, like i just don't eh, <laughs> like this isn't very consistent you know but right. <laughs> um wait, so you're saying you're not a closet tree hugger <laughs> <laughs> i would say you know, I, I think technically i could say like after all the years of trying to you know i, I worked for forest forever for a little while and uh I had appreciation when I was a kid and you know, I still love going hiking and whatnot. I was in Denver last week and we did some hiking out there and I, I, I love being outdoors. I really do appreciate it, you know? And, um, yeah, I just don't, I just don't see how that's incompatible necessarily with capitalism. And like, I just feel like that's just one of those other things where it's just such a, uh, polarized yet simplistic view that comes from the left. And a lot of times the, the greens and mm. you know, environmentalists and stuff where mm. they demonize just things they don't understand, you right. know, and right. I think we we're all kind of there at one point, you know, at least, I mean, when I, my first waking up, you know, when I was kind of getting interested in Occupy, Occupy Wall Street, I was saying fuck capitalism too, just because I didn't have any understanding what it was. Right. And didn't, exactly. You know, it just sounded like, yeah, fuck that. Like, that's what's wrong <laughs> with everything. So, but, uh, yeah. All right. So before we go, I'm gonna I'm gonna mention two videos that you just reminded me of. The first one is um, Prescription Nature. Have you seen that one? No. It's no. an awesome. It's like a like a two minute video, and it's made in like um the style of a medication. You know, they like you know, are you drowsy? Do you feel down? Do you feel mm-hmm. depressed? You, do you do you have problems sleeping? Well, maybe you should talk <laughs> to your doctor about nature. It's, it's suitable for people of all ages. Even pets enjoy it. <laughs> and the guy's like... Helps your depression. <laughs> the guy's like... And, and he, he jumps into the lake naked. He's like... And, and then it makes you question, what the fuck are you doing with your life? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. I'm going to put that I'm gonna put that in the description of the video. That's an awesome video that I sent to a lot of people. And then the other one you reminded me of was um, Peter Schiff talks to Occupy Wall Street. Have you seen oh. that? Oh, that's an awesome. I love that video. <laughs> that's that's gold. That's pure gold. The entire video is gold. I, I can watch that. Sometimes I'll just put it on. Like every six months or so, I just put that on. And my <laughs> lord, Peter Schiff has the patience of a saint I talking know, to those I people. Know. And, you know, like he never once gets upset. There's the most annoying people in the world <laughs> saying the most outlandish, ridiculous shit to him. And he's just sitting there like, no, no, this is why and this yeah. is how. And, <laughs> that guy's amazing. Yeah, I really I have a lot of credit for uh, I give a lot of credit to Peter Schiff for that video, oh, I mean, especially being surrounded by all those people. I mean, I hope he had a bodyguard or two. You know, <laughs> I know, because right? They seem kind of hostile and like he, he he was all dressed up. He had a suit and tie on. I know. And, <laughs> oh, that's a brilliant video. I definitely yeah. If you could put that in the description of the yeah. the link of this, yeah. I'd highly recommend anybody who's watching this video check that out because his knowledge compared to the Occupy the Occupiers is just like. It's nine day difference, you know, like, and it's amazing. None, you know. Oh yeah. It won't won't bore you at all. And I was actually going to say one other thing too. One other link you should put in the description of this video is the stand up that you did. I saw that stand up, and it's good, man. I really Thank enjoy you. that. Yeah, you you rocked it in New York, New York City, I think, right? That was yeah, that was it, great, man. At, at New York Comedy Club. Thank you. That was uh one of my better shows. I have to say, you know, I gave you my best show, so don't judge all of my videos to be like that because uh, <laughs> I've certainly got sure. crickets and booze and all that fun stuff. But uh, but yeah, those, those couple couple of times, you know, you get a, a really awesome audience and really responsive. And also, you know, what's very important as a comedian is going up at the right time, right? The comedian that goes up when yeah. the, when the checks are given and nobody's sure. paying attention. Poor, poor guy <laughs> right you know, sure. that, that guy. also also people usually at the end of the show are mostly drunk so they can't even understand what you're talking about. that's true and, i wonder and, if that works to your favor or does that work against you do people laugh more or less they get more no i think i think um i don't know i guess it depends on the type of comedy you do but but i would think that the drunk people tend to heckle more 
and also yeah. they don't pay attention necessarily to what you're saying, so or they don't care what you're saying. <laughs> so I would prefer like beginning to middle, you know, preferably. But, sure. But yeah, the, yeah, the, that show I sent you just the chips just lined up and it was just beautiful. That bit about your name was brilliant too, man. That was like, <laughs> uh, that me that me rolling. That was really good. I was like, all right, I got to make sure I get his name right. I can't fuck that up. I got them all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah no it was uh it was great i think oh, you should include that i think i think one thing i learned about comedy um and i took away with that is the importance of self-deprecation sure how you know yeah. we, we can't take ourselves too seriously you know right. you have to you have to lighten up you have to you know laugh at yourself because you know if you you know if you don't laugh at yourself other people will and you're just gonna feel bad and you know you got to be the first one to say I'm a jerk. I know. I I suck. I I make mistakes. You know, and, sure. and then people are gonna be like, "All right, this guy's cool." <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I agree. Well, yeah, you hit the nail on the head with that one, man. I uh, enjoyed that and definitely uh, gave me some inspiration. Cool. Maybe one of these days I'll get out there and do some stand up myself. But uh, oh, highly suggested. <laughs> Don't count on it, but I'll, maybe. <laughs> I'll, I'll, fly, I'll fly out to California when you do. You know, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> sure, man. Yeah, please do. And okay. you're always welcome. You know, whenever you, if you ever come out to California, please let me know. Oh, awesome! That'd be, be really cool. Be great to get a drink. Yeah. So, so um, yeah. Before we go, just um, let people know once again uh, where they can find you and you know plug your sites again. Sure, man. Yeah, we're at thefreethoughtproject.com. Um, we're pretty much on all major social media platforms we're on twitter we're on instagram we're on google plus uh, uh shit we even have a tumblr um we have youtube um of course please the police that's uh my other project um that's on facebook and twitter um check out vias for voluntary especially you anarchists um voluntarists that's my anarchist page uh put a lot of love and time into that also check out our uh, facebook page and the drug war that's another one that we've started to kind of gain some steam on. I think it has like 200,000 fans now. And uh, I feel like we're putting out good content in the vein of ending the drug war as well. And definitely be some content on there that makes you think a little bit and you probably want to share. So awesome. But uh, yeah. And also I just wanted to give a shout out to Chase Rachel's too. And oh, if, if you guys haven't read this book yet, beautiful book, um, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, please do. It's uh what is the full name? Spontaneous Order, the Capitalist Case for a Stateless Society. It's great. I mean, it really does run through everything, especially if you've gone through Kokesh's freedom. Mm. And you feel like that resonates with you. Uh, it's almost kind of similar. It just kind of goes through a little bit more, has a little bit more meat. Uh, it goes you know, down the line of different uh, principles and aspects, axioms of uh, libertarianism that we, we think is important. Chase thought it was important. Uh, Chase is a great writer. Um, one of, I think, one of the up and coming thought leaders of our of our time and of our movement. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, that was kind of the only shout out and promotion I wanted to give because <laughs> that that book has been awesome for me to kind of refine some Beautiful. of my theories. Yeah. Oh, I love yeah that guy. This guy guy's really awesome. I, I saw him. Uh, I met him uh, last year in October in um, Asheville. We went down there to visit. And right. him and Michelle I met all the other people too. You know the other volunteers. It's just a, it's just a strange thing, you know, to be to be surrounded by no <laughs> volunteers and then to be surrounded by volunteers. I'm like, wait a minute, wait, wait. I don't have to describe <laughs> the taxation of theft to you. Is, is that are you sure. serious? We can talk about other things. Oh man, that's 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 weird. <laughs> you know, I really hope that you make it out to Anarchapoco next year too, because that feeling was so prolific and. I mean, it was just everywhere, like at, at that conference. I mean, it felt like there was a unity amongst everybody. If you're going down an elevator or if you're getting food at a restaurant, I mean, you'd recognize somebody who was just at the conference with you and you're on, you automatically had a, a connection. And, right, right. you know, it's, it, it is a really powerful thing. And yeah, it, it is really wonderful when we do have these conferences and festivals and whatnot where we can kind of be around like minds. I mean, it really reaffirms a lot of our beliefs and kind of reminds you too that you're not the only one because a lot of times it does feel like, you know, all of your friends are just internet friends and that mm, like right. all the people that hold your same beliefs are far away. And right. I guess a lot of times they are, but, you know, they do exist and they are they are here and so yeah 
Well, that's, but, why, uh, that, that's why I love doing these interviews because I, I bring out sure. the humanity in in just, you know, Facebook profiles <laughs> or, yeah. face, or Facebook pages, you know, and, and I, I love to, you know, bring the human aspect to it that, you know, we're just people, we're separated by large distances, but the internet is connecting us and it's a beautiful right. thing. It's breaking down borders, it's breaking down nation states and nationalities and, you know, all these divisive concepts. Sure. Um, and erroneous and, beliefs. Yeah, yep. yeah, and so it's it's really uniting humanity, you know, as as one brotherhood, and uh, and it's awesome. It's beautiful. Speaking of which, just if you can try to get Matt, Matt Agaris, who's uh, the, the other half of the Free Thought Project. You know, he does such amazing work. He's an awesome writer. Um, oh yeah. Every day, that guy's pouring his heart and soul into to stories, and he's he's a workaholic. That guy's a huge part of the Free Thought Project. Is Many of, I mean, we're all a huge team. I just want to also mention, you know, I am the co-founder, but I'm just one part of the Free Thought Project. You know, like there's, there's a few of us who are all kind of part of the team, and everybody just has such great work ethic. They all put so much time and effort into what we're trying to do. So I just want to say that because you know I don't want to, I don't want anybody to ever think that it's just me or right. you know, it, it's it's everybody part of the Free Thought Project. We're all trying to do our best. So. Um, but yeah, try to get Matt Agris on if you can one of these days. So, so you're saying you didn't reach 1.3 million likes on your own? Like, like, <laughs> like when were you sleeping? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> no, yeah. it's definitely a group effort. Yeah, hard yeah. Workers. Oh yeah, I definitely want to get Matt on. Um, hopefully, so we'll, well, yeah, I'll definitely contact him. That's cool. Um, I just want to ask you one more question. Um, when did you make VS for Voluntary? When did that start? That was uh, early 2013, if I remember correctly. So roughly okay. about okay yeah, because about because years. that one and um, I only owe you non-aggression. That's Matt's page. That's Matt's page. Okay, those two, maybe statism and slavery too, were the ones that really transformed me when I was really starting to think about these concepts. And I remember walking in my clinic as an acupuncturist, you know, just waiting for a patient to be done. And I got to take the needles out and I'm, I'm looking at my phone and I'm, ch I'm checking my Facebook and looking at these awesome memes and saving them. And, uh, and, it, and it's just, it was changing my way of thinking. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome stuff. It resonates with me. And so I just want to say that you guys have tr influenced me in my transformation. <laughs> <laughs> oh man thanks for sharing that that so, just that makes my week yeah <laughs> yeah really, so that's really cool to hear that it's a really beautiful thing it's a, it's amazing uh we you know we feed off each other and and like i'm sure you get those messages where people say you know thank you so much for what you do i really appreciate it. you guys are doing such awesome work and you know you help me to understand this stuff more and you know thank you you know and and i get that too and it's a beautiful thing so you know it's funny how it all comes full, full circle man and you know i could say the same thing i was uh, you know, in my waking up process, I was very influenced and motivated by Lou Krudowski and a lot of his work and, you know, confronting uh, politicians and kind of his guerrilla journalism tactics. And, hmm. uh, you know, a couple of years later, I was sitting on a panel with him oh, at the wow. Free Your Mind conference, you nice. know, and so it's funny how things just come full circle. And I think if you just put enough work into this and if you care enough about these issues, you'll end up meeting the people that helped you kind of come to some of these same co conclusions and some of the celebritarians that you've, you know, find value from or whatever. I mean, it, it was cool meeting Anna Bukash. It was cool meeting Jeff Berwick and these people who have, yeah, shaped some of my my ideology and beliefs, you know? So, yeah. And I, like I said, it's, it's wonderful to hear when, we, whatever we do have, I mean, I, I really I appreciate you sharing that with me. It's really awesome when I, we do hear that because, you know, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. that's why we work so hard. This is our life's work is yeah. to try to change the paradigm. So, Oh yeah. Thanks, the, the way I like to describe it to people is, is we're planting the seeds from which we will yep. not necessarily appreciate the shade. Yep. Shade will come for the future generations, right? So yep. we're just planting the seeds. And it's kind of hard for people to understand that, you know, you want to see yeah. instantaneous gratification, instantaneous results, but you know, shifting yeah. the minds and paradigms is it's not like that <laughs> you know yeah no exactly it's Take, a long process it takes yeah. really hard work so i really appreciate what you guys are doing um please everyone you know visit free thought project fees for voluntary police to police help out these guys give them likes um you know shares and all that good stuff um because yeah, i think that um you know you're doing a good good job for humanity for the world for the future and, uh, you know, it's vital. And, you know, like the way Larkin Rose says it, you know, one day in the future, people are going to look back and say, you know what? It was a good idea that we were having these conversations. Yep. <laughs> you know, right. it's like just saying, you know, all interactions should be voluntary is self-evident. But still, 
it needs to be said. Why does that need to be sense. said? You know? Sure. Yeah, I think sometimes that's the hardest part is some of this stuff seems so second nature, but we, we have to repeat it and actually acknowledge some of these points because they have been so lost in the, you know, the sea of statism. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely wonderful. I'm, I'm very happy and grateful for the opportunity to be on your show. I definitely appreciate it. It's always nice talking to a, a fellow volunt- voluntarist and shooting the shit for a little while. So. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Danny Lowe. No problem. So so before we go, I like to ask my guests, uh, what is your favorite quote of all time? One's a Hans Hermann Hoppe quote. It doesn't really have like any really profound, it doesn't seem super profound, but to me it's like a, a good quote. And it's uh, expropriating property protector is a contradiction in terms. And nice. It's very short and sweet, nice. but nice. I mean, it's it's kind of, if you think about it, it makes total sense because that's what the state's claiming to do is be a property protector at the same time they're claiming to tax us, which is quite the opposite of prop- protecting our property, you know? So I don't know. I uh, definitely love me some Hans Hermann Hoppe. It takes a little while to absorb and really understand it. Like I said, I'm still kind of in that phase of trying to up my game. Mm with some of that type of information and material. I'm actually reading his book of economics and uh, ethics of private property, which is a good one. Um, I'd recommend that to anybody, but I think I'll probably have to go with that quote just because uh, I have been kind of reading a lot of Hoppe lately. So Cool. Actually, I haven't, uh, I don't think I've read any of his, um, I think he wrote one, what's it called? Democracy something? The God That Failed. Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if I read that one. I don't know. I don't think I did, but... Yeah, I, I, I've been reading a bunch of ones. Thomas Sowell and Tom Woods and got Robert Murphy and I got, yeah, the Conscious Resistance book was awesome. You know, Spontaneous sure. Order, Freedom, yeah, all this gross. stuff, you know. Yeah, um, I really do feel like there's so much. And oh, I, yeah. you know, I, t- I touched on that earlier, but I mean, just it's it really is, and especially when you take the police state into account. I mean, that's a whole other, you know, aspect of things that we focus on. And so, I mean, as far as all the theory and economics, and I mean, there's such a deep bottomless pit of information that's out there. And I mean, Rothbard and Mises really, Jesus, man, that was so long ago. And they've really just set, you know, so much information aside for us to really delve into and look at. And I I don't know how many people really do. I mean, I think there's very few of us that tend to read all of that stuff, but there's so much, there's so much good information. And, you know, just to make it really quick, that's one other thing too, which I really think and comms and socialists are really thin on is they don't really have like these scholars and intellectuals, at least currently, maybe back in, you know, the 1800s or something, they're really prolific and interested in some of the topics that they're still trying to keep alive. But like, that's one thing that I feel like we really have going for us is the, even the Mises Academy and the Mises yeah. Institute. I mean, right. there's so many people, so many intelligent people on our side of the camp who are just putting out such great information, so many different, uh, types of information and you know pieces and it's amazing it really is it's hard to keep up with everything yeah yeah indeed indeed we uh we definitely do a lot of reading and research and uh in the end you know i think uh, most of our um you know conclusion is pretty much the same like i don't know how people should live their lives you know Th- that's why i think they should be free you know they should have sure. lead their own lives like I don't know what's, I barely know what's good for me. How am I going to know what's good for my neighbor? Like, <laughs> Right. <laughs> Very true. I think that's more or less what it comes down to. Yeah, but basically. <laughs> there is surprisingly a lot of theory included in just liberty, the idea of liberty right. and what it takes to maintain the idea of liberty. And, you know, that once again, I think those are the things that kind of get pushed aside and ignored by people who aren't necessarily as interested in the intellectual side of things and, you know, everybody has their place, you know, and hopefully uh, more people will be interested in the, the philosophies and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I don't know. To me, I'm just grateful that it's all there waiting for me when I do have the time occasionally to read it. And, you know, there's only more growing by the day. And, right. uh, so but I definitely check out Chase Rachel's book because I feel like that's one of probably the, the more uh, easily digestible yet yeah. still has plenty of substance. Right. You know, and, right. Awesome. So. Cool. It's, well, it's it's easy to, to talk about all this different information and <laughs> go on about tons of books and writers and, you, you know, know. Jason, God but, damn it. Why you got to be so interesting? All right. We, you got to stop talking. <laughs> so no, it's, it's been great. So, yeah, thanks a lot for coming to the show. Really appreciate it. 
uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, so if anybody wants to help me out, you can do so through um, PayPal, Bitcoin, or Patreon. Uh, links are below. That's patreon.com slash peaceful anarchism to help me out. Um, dollar a show is all I ask. Uh, if you find value in this content, please, please feel free to, to contribute. Um, you know, value for value. That's the capitalist way we respond to incentives, right? <laughs> Voting with right. your dollar. That's the only do- democracy I support. You vote with your dollar. You want to see something more of in the world, you you patronize it. You you purchase it. You vote You vote, vote with, with your, your dollar, right? Uh, or right. vote with your feet. You can do either one. Just don't vote <laughs> in the ballot box, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, no guns necessary for uh, for purchase. So, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. Awesome uh, conversation. Um, so this is P- Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.